uh, board member of the FCCT. I'll be your moderator for today's event. Uh, we are here with uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Wasserstrom uh, to talk about what's happening in Hong Kong and what that means for the wider region, including Thailand, especially Thailand, actually. Um, it's been over three years since the Milk Tea Alliance of Human Rights Activists um, first emerged in places like Hong Kong, Thailand, Taiwan, and eventually in Myanmar. Uh, but since then, as we all know, uh, there's been a dramatic constriction of political space in Hong Kong that has uh, pushed many youth activists into exile or into prison. Uh, Jeff perhaps needs no introduction because he last spoke here in 2022. Uh, but for those who missed his last talk, all right, uh, here's a little bit about him. He's the Chancellor Pro Chancellor's Professor of History at the University of California, Irvine, uh, author of uh, Vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink. The book is right there if you want to browse through it later. Uh, this was published in 2020. Uh, Jeff is also a frequent uh, contributor about uh, China issues in media outlets like the New York Times, Nikkei Asia, and the Mekong Review. So um, this is going to be done in a conversational format, and we're going to take some questions from the floor afterwards. If you are really, really eager to ask your questions, and I'm uh, taking a bit too long with my questions, just raise your hands later so that I will take the cue from you and we will proceed on to the Q&A, okay? Right, so to kick things off, Jeff, um, I would like to ask you, you know, how long you have been working on issues like protest and repression, uh, and how did you end up focusing so much on Hong Kong events? And I also noticed you have gotten interested about what's happening in Thailand recently, and how did that happen? Sure, it's a real pleasure to be back here, and in a way, the talk I'm, or this, this topic is a sequel to, uh, in 2022, the f I focused on uh, protests and the Milk Tea Alliance and what connected people from different parts of East and Southeast Asia from kind of bottom up. And this will talk more about how uh, crackdowns um, are borrowing techniques across the region. Um, I've really been interested in protests my whole, um, my whole adult life. I've been working, when I was a, in graduate school, I wrote a dissertation on student protests in China in the first half of the 20th century. And I guess my, my interest in protests went back to being a kid growing up in America um, in a progressive family that would take the family to anti-Vietnam War um, protests. And so when I was a little kid, I went to these events and I, I was fascinated by how big crowds of people kind of knew what to do. And these were the closest things to religious experiences I ever felt, being in a big crowd of people who were chanting at the same time, um, singing the same songs and things like that. So when I went to graduate school and was starting to focus on China, I was fascinated by Chinese student movements. And one thing that intrigued me and has always intrigued me was that in the United States, sometimes if there was, if students were active about a cause, sometimes the reaction of the wider population would be, oh, well, they're just students. What are they doing uh, getting involved in politics? And in the Chinese case, there was, oh, students are protesting. Maybe we should protest too. And in the early 20th century in China, events like the May 4th movement in 1919, students would take to the streets and then workers would join them and it would swell into this um, mass movement with people following the leads of young people on the streets. So in my dissertation, I was interested in these kind of two topics. How do people know what to do when they get together in big crowds uh, to start a protest? And I got interested in how repertoires of action are communicated between generations, how people know what script to follow. And I was also intrigued by this idea like, what is it about some settings where students can take the lead, young people can take the lead, young educated people, and large numbers of other people will sometimes follow them out onto the streets. So I, I was working on Chinese student movements of the 1910s to the 1940s, and I finished a dissertation in the spring of 1989, when something like that was happening again in China after a period of, of not having those kinds of things happen much. And even in 1986, when I was in China doing research, uh, for this dissertation, there were some warm-up protests for that. So 
that moved me from being a historian who only focuses on the past to increasingly a historian who focuses on the past and how it relates to the present. Then in the 1990s and early 2000s, protests like the ones I'd been studying were no longer happening on the Chinese mainland, or at least not much. Students were not taking the lead in mass movements. And then Hong Kong, suddenly that was the story there. And this tradition of protests that I felt had sort of died out or largely died out. It's never died out completely. There have been protests just last year, by uh, a year and a half ago, by students on the mainland that shows it's not completely dead. But it was as though a baton had been passed from the mainland with Tiananmen to Hong Kong with events like the umbrella movement of the 2010s. And I started focusing on that, which led me to write this um, little book about Hong Kong. And then the protests stopped in Hong Kong with um, uh, crackdown in 2020, early 2020, and it was as though the baton had been passed to Thai activists when these big protests that were in part reminiscent of the scenes that I had been watching and writing about in Hong Kong and had sometimes been in Hong Kong to witness, I was seeing scenes on the television screen from Thailand. And I had also started to get interested in Thailand in the middle of the 2010s when um, two things happen that, were linked, that link up to the story of repression across a region, which was that I was following Hong Kong and a group of Hong Kong booksellers who were publishing books that made fun of the Chinese, were gossipy works about the Chinese Communist Party leadership and were otherwise pushing the envelope. Um, they, several of them were arrested and ended up in um, detention on the mainland. One of them was kidnapped out of Thailand and actually he's the one who's still in jail. Gui Min Hai. So in 2015, Thailand kind of got on my radar screen because of this kidnapping. And then Joshua Wong, one of the Hong Kong activists that I was studying at that point and who I'd met, um, was invited to come to, to Thailand uh, to speak at, um, at Chula University. And uh, he was stopped at the airport and blocked from coming in and detained for 12 hours uh, by the Chinese authorities presumably with collaboration uh, from the Thai authorities, and then he was sent back um, on a plane to Hong Kong and unable to speak in Thailand. Though he then gave his talk anyway through what was then a fairly unusual method of Skyping in to give a talk um, before everything was being done on Zoom. So I started to be interested in the possible connection between repression going on in, um, in China and Hong Kong and, pro and going on in Thailand, and protests going on in Hong Kong and Thailand, and the connections between those. So that's how, once I, after I finished Vigil, I started working on this Milk Tea Alliance connection between them. That got me more interested in Thailand and brought me here um, to interview people as well. Great, thank you. So let's like dive into the granular of it. What have you observed about the way the Hong Kong authorities are exerting control at this point? So the Hong Kong authorities, when, when the protests were going on in 2019, um, what the media focused on and what I think ordinary people focused on because of the, the memory of the Tiananmen protests and the fact that some activists, uh, that, that in Hong Kong, activism has been related to the um, Tiananmen uh, vigil for the Tiananmen, um, uh, for the massacre of, of 1989 had always been held in Hong Kong. One thing that happened when there were big protests in Hong Kong is the press and other people and commentators kept saying, will there be a Tiananmen ending? Meaning, will there be a massacre? And so there was a kind of, way, and this was actually during the umbrella movement first, there was talk, would there be a Tiananmen solution? And so the idea was that the thing to think about when you were trying to understand the repressive techniques, what would the Communist Party of China do? Would it do something like it did on the mainland in 1989? And they didn't do that. I think quite intentionally, they didn't want to have um, body, blood on the streets. Um, so somehow it was conveyed to the Hong Kong um, police during these giant protests, don't don't create martyrs, don't create a massacre, we're not gonna have troops on the streets. Have the police do it, have the police do it without killing people, if possible. 
And what the police did was they wounded an incredible number of people. They used tear gas in un, uh, sometimes unprecedented ways, including letting tear gas canisters off in enclosed uh, subway stations. Um, and there was a beanbag shot, there were rubber bullets, there was very little live ammunition used. So the movement was broken through, um, through mass arrests, through um, denigration of the protesters, and also trying to, trying to egg on the protests so that the protesters themselves became, some of them, became violent, and the hope was that would alienate uh, the masses of people in Hong Kong. Though up to the end of 2019, even when there were very rowdy and even uh, a lot of um, rowdiness by the protesters, a majority of Hong Kongers still thought that the police were uh, responsible for more of the violence going on than the protesters. They kept turning out. But then the movement, the movement ended and the crackdown began. And I wrote a piece for um, Nikkei Asia. And Nikkei Asia is special to me. Uh, when I give a talk here, Gwen Robinson was the person who first got me uh, to, to, to speak here in 2022 and helped set this up as well. And I wrote for Nikkei Asia um, a piece about the crackdown in Hong Kong uh, in 2020 being like Tiananmen without the massacre. And Louisa Lim, one of the journalists I most admire who's worked on these issues, also talked about the Chinese authorities using the Tiananmen playbook um, much of it was used. By, what, by that, what I mean is painting the protests as riots rather than peaceful uh, demonstrations that, or even peaceful ones that got out of hand, um, intimidating, arresting, doing a variety of things, presenting a story of it being a Western-backed um, uh, conspiracy in which uh, innocent youth were manipulated and made by black hands behind the scenes, the storyline that was put out by the official media on the Chinese mainland about protests in Hong Kong was very similar. The efforts to discredit the activists were very much the playbook used by the mainland authorities in 1989, but it was different because there wasn't the massacre and there weren't the use of uh, the soldiers, but there were very similar kinds of things going on. So that was one way to think about the crackdown. But then the other thing that as I was looking at the, the, the specifics of um, um, the repression used, there were other, two other parallels that started to come to mind. One was how similar in some ways um, the throttling of Hong Kong, which had been promised that it would be able to be a special part of China and have a, fair, a lot of autonomy, but then over time that autonomy disappeared. That was reminiscent of actually what the Chinese Communist Party had done in the 1950s with Tibet. So that was one parallel. But also looking at some of the specific things that were being done in Hong Kong, once Thailand was on my mind for the Milk Tea Alliance, and once I was talking to Thai scholars and uh, who I've begun to collaborate with, I was struck by an almost eerie set of parallels between what was happening and what's been happening in Hong Kong in the last three years and what happened in Thailand in 2014 through about 2017 or 2018, or even on up to the present. So I started to think about what was happening in Hong Kong it wasn't just like Tiananmen without the massacre, but the Thai martial law without a coup. So if we think about this, who's in charge of Hong Kong now? It's not a military authority, but it's somebody whose background is in the police. What is the story um, that's being told by the Hong Kong authorities about what's happening in Hong Kong. Well, there was this period when things just spun out of control and a firm hand needed to be, to be taken on what was going on, but now everything's fine. This is the story that's being told by the Hong Kong authorities. Now everything's fine, so tourists should come back, international businesses uh, shouldn't worry. Uh, there needs to be a kind of focus on law, order, and stability, but otherwise it can be a place that will be good to have fun and to buy stuff again. That was very much what happened in Thailand in 2014, uh, 2015. In Hong Kong, there's even now a kind of happy Hong Kong campaign with songs and things that are being done. In Thailand in 2014, there was the happiness returns to um, Thailand campaign with a television show that the junta was behind. I mean, there are differences. No comparison is perfect. For example, 
the military authority in Thailand actually wrote one of the happiness songs and hosted a television show. So the, the Chinese authority, uh, the Hong Kong authority rather, he's not nearly as charismatic or creative. He's not doing that. But this kind of idea of saying there was a moment when there was, um, there was chaos on the streets, but now things are under control. And if there are other things. Once you start looking at this, there are things that are kind of, again, I think eerily similar. Uh, what, one of the things that happened most recently in Hong Kong was that there was an election in which only hand-picked kind of people could run. So it was made not just illegal to, uh, to oppose the it was made illegal to try to get people to not vote in that election because the authorities wanted the election to look like a normal election so that this would go along with this idea that order had been destroyed. Something very similar happened in Thailand in 2016 with a constitutional referendum, a, a modification of the constitution that was supposed to be part of legitimating and perpetuating the junta. And one of the acts of protest was to rip up a ballot to say, to say this isn't a legitimate election and to process, and people were prosecuted for that. There's also, as what's happening now in Thailand that I think um, people here would be more aware of, um, would know more of the details than me, there's a lot of um, putting a whole series of charges over the heads of activists to try to, to, to try to silence them or intimidate them, and the processes of these working their way through the courts can take years a kind of slow process of um, trying to take control. In Hong Kong, there haven't been things like the lead activists were not all arrested right away. It happened gradually, let the world's attention um, shift to other places. There wasn't, um, there still it hasn't been a long sentencing of some of the uh, people most associated with the 2020, uh, the 2019 protests in Hong Kong, but there are endless kinds of court procedures that keep them off the streets and in Hong Kong in detention. In Thailand, sometimes they're at liberty, but with this hanging over their head. So there are various ways of using the law in, in kind of ways that do suggest whether the authority, there's not a, there's not a kind of um, top-down counterpart to the Milk Tea Alliance in which people are explicitly saying, we're all in this together. But there's a way in which we can think of autocrats in different parts of, um, East and Southeast Asia, borrowing tricks from each other and sometimes uh, collaborating with each other. And there was an event here last night that was about um, transnational repression, that was about specific moments of things like the kidnap allowing the Hong Kong bookseller to be kidnapped out of uh, Thailand and taken uh, to the mainland, and other activists from one place are spirited back to their, their country to be punished. Thank you, that's a lot to take in. So two questions arrive from that, right? This narrative of happiness that you are seeing in Hong Kong, is that working? And then also, um, you just talked about Thailand and Hong Kong. Do you see uh, parallels um, of this uh, playbook uh, being adopted in other parts of the region, or also the world? So I think th there are things in, uh, there are parallels to some of these things in many parts of the world, but I'm struck by, how valuable it is and, and how we sometimes miss out on this. Stories are often told as either one country stories or global stories. But I think the Milk Tea Alliance and some of this transnational repression in ASEAN or ASEAN plus China is um, a reminder of how much regional stories can still matter. So Singapore, I think Singapore championed this idea of um, how to have an autocratic system, but one in which you can give the impression to international tourists and international businesses that everything's fine. And having these quite specific red lines that can't be crossed and that can get people in trouble if they talk about some to certain topics, but allow other topics to be discussed that also gives that impression to the casual observer that things are freer than they are. Um, my favorite. Um, article about um, about uh, Singapore written early on that was in Wired magazine by the great science fiction writer William Gibson, describes Singapore as Disneyland with the death penalty. 
And you know that you could have one way. And, and, and now I see this where some people can travel to Hong Kong and say, yeah, I mean, there was repression there, but it still seems like you can do much of the things you could before. But you can't if you're talking about certain kinds of things, or if you're paying attention to certain kinds of symbols, things have changed very dramatically. Um, obviously, in the terms of the kind of repression side of the story, also um, Myanmar is very relevant to this also. And actually, thinking about Burma, Myanmar, Thailand, and Hong Kong together, the flow of uh, some protest tactics and symbols flowed between all three of those places. Um, the Hunger Games uh, symbol of the three finger salute um, was first used in Hong Kong and um, Thailand in 2014 as a protest uh, symbol. It really took off in Thailand. It was a minor thing in Hong Kong, but in Hong Kong in 2019, a catchphrase linked to that, the Hunger Games movies and novels, if we burn, you burn with us, became a big deal in Hong Kong. One of the last, I was at a big demonstration in Hong Kong in December of 2019, and at the demonstration, one thing I saw was a poster up of Jennifer Lawrence in the uh, role of Katniss Everdeen, the young activist um, from the Hunger Games. And um, anyway, so that flowed that way, and then the Three Finger Salute in particular took off in, in Myanmar, Burma after the coup in a way because of Thailand. So there's a flow of those things and also a flow of strategies of repression. Mm. Uh, let me take you back to what you said earlier about red lines. Uh, what are the red lines you see in Hong Kong at this point? So, um, so I'm very aware, I mean, I'm very aware of how things have shifted in Hong Kong. Um, I, I went to Hong Kong throughout the, the, the 2010s, and one thing I did was speak at the Foreign Correspondence Club there, and I was keenly aware at that point that I was saying all sorts of things in a public setting uh, in a part of the People's Republic of China that I couldn't say in the same way in any other part of the People's Republic of China. Um, except maybe in Macau, except nobody would come to hear the talk because they'd all be at the casinos. But no, there was, um, there was a way in which the Hong Kong was a place where there weren't many red lines at that point. Um, basically, anything went. At the, I, at the Hong Kong FCC, I could talk about what would be banned, and at Hong Kong campuses, I could talk about things or that, were, that really couldn't be done on the mainland, or could only be done in the mainland in a very, uh, in a controlled space. There were a few international programs where you could say things that you couldn't say in any other part of the mainland, but people would have to show an ID often to get into those places, like at NYU Shanghai, where I gave a talk. But I could do things on a Hong Kong campus. So I remember at a Hong Kong campus in 2017 or 2018, I showed a PowerPoint in which I showed images of Xi Jinping as uh, being mocked as Winnie the Pooh. He had just done away with term limits, and it was Winnie the Pooh wearing a crown. And one of the um, Hong Kong uh, academics there said, oh, I guess you're not planning on getting a visa to go to the mainland anytime soon. And it was, I actually had a visa to go to the mainland, but I knew I couldn't give that, pow I couldn't do that PowerPoint at that point at a Chinese, at a university on the mainland, a regular university, without worrying about getting my host into trouble, uh, whether or not it got me kicked, kicked out. So it was a sense of a place without red lines, but clearly there are those now in Hong Kong, and the red lines are um, certain kinds of discussions about Hong Kong itself, which is something that is very reminiscent of Singapore, where mm -hmm. you can talk about what's going on in many parts of the world. You can talk about one party rule, but if you don't specifically link it to the place where you are, it's, it's possible for that. Um, a red line was a song was made crossing a red line. The song Glory to Hong Kong became something um, that, that you could get um, punished for singing. It became the anthem of the protests and was seen as, um, was described as something that was about um, independence. So that was a red line in that. Um, 
and there's a flow of the concern about um, that there were it used to be there were all kinds of books obviously the bookseller thing was this there were books um, the only kind of book about Xi Jinping really that you can you could sell on the mainland bookstore was a positive one but in um, Hong Kong you could you could have one that was critical of them and that's disappeared but there was also a way that the only kind of thing that could be said about the Dalai Lama on the mainland would be a negative thing but in Hong Kong you could have a positive um, you could have a positive um, biography about him so there was a there's been a collapsing of or a migration of some of the main the red lines from the mainland into Hong Kong but a big Hong Kong, a big, big red line is specifically things about Hong Kong itself and about the top leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. And it is almost as though this trying to make it any kind of criticism of the person of the leader of the Chinese Communist Party and his family and people close to him, sometimes it feels as though Xi Jinping not only has some trappings of, a, of an emperor, but has almost a kind of lays majesty envy or something like that. Um, yet at the same time, as we talked uh, before this uh, event, um, you mentioned, uh, we talked about how you know, stereotypes do feed into the portrayal of Hong Kong and also uh, you know, Thailand, you know, since we're talking about Thailand. Um, what are some of the political myths you see about Hong Kong? at this point? Uh, what are some of the uh, wrong perceptions of Hong Kong you see floating out there? So um, one of the things that there always used to be uh, misperception, I think this is some, it, this is actually periodically this, this misperception comes about young people in many parts of the world, but then it's overlaid with some things, stereotypes about, um, about, about Asia are this notion of a kind of a place that isn't, doesn't really, that ordinary people don't really care about politics or something, that there's a sense of surprise when there was so much political activism in Hong Kong, because it was supposed to be a place that just cared about um, eating good food and enjoying life and making money. And so the, the, but this is something that keeps kind of showing up in certain times, that there's often a time that a generation is a, that young people don't care about politics the way they used to or aren't going to take care of actors, and then there's a new set of youth movements thing. So that was the stereotype that needed to be exploded, um, that was exploded in Hong Kong, and I think there was some of that in Thailand too, before 2020. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, there used to be this tradition of um, student, student activism, where did it go? And then suddenly you had an enormous, largely student-led uh, movement. But now I think one of the, the challenges is that there's an idea uh, that the Hong Kong story, it just is hard to keep the focus on it um, because the repression has been such a kind of gradualist thing. It, to people in, I, what I see is when I talk to people who are still in Hong Kong, they talk about how fast things have been changing. Certain things were changing at warp speed. And one kind of story that's told in the media, one kind of story is this place that used to be so free, look how quickly it's, um, it's, trans, it's, it's changed. And it's dropped dramatically from, uh, in all kinds of rankings of press freedom, in rankings of academic freedom, in rankings of other kinds of freedom. It's dropped gr dramatically um, and come closer to say Thailand and some of those um, some of those metrics but it's also been a very slow throttling rather than the boot falling very quickly that the authorities went after one social group in, in one news cycle another and another news cycle and then the protracted um, thing so just to get a sense of this being a place that's undergoing an ongoing steady uh, repression is a hard story to keep attention on, especially when there's so many other parts of the world where such dramatically terrible things are happening fast and killing people as opposed to just sort of breaking, um, um, breaking them. That's true. Um, at this point, do, does anybody have any questions for Jeff? Um, if you do, we've got a microphone at the back that you can hear too. Uh, we've got a question 
please wait a moment, the mic is coming. One moment, please. Um, so I, I, my question is, because um, I really like how you pick the similarities between the two. So if we look at some other similar cases, like what happened in Taiwan during the uh, 22A protest, and then in Korea uh, with the Guangzhou protest, and then how the society kind of transformed afterwards, and they start to keep going back to the events with artistic um, expressions made subsequently, even till today, they, they keep revisiting those subject matters in films and artworks and painting videos. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit of that, if there's any similarity between what happened in Taiwan and, and Korea on those events. Oh, Thank thanks you. a lot. That's a, that's a great question. And I think this is something that, um, that is, I, I, you know, I, I, I spent the early part of my career kind of resisting this idea of being somebody who did Asian studies because I thought of the different parts of Asia as so dramatically different, and I thought that was just playing into certain kinds of stereotypes. But there is something that, that shows up. In, in many parts of the world, obviously, you know, massacres are something that, it, massacres of protesters are something that galvanize people. But a particular focus on anniversaries of massacres um, is something that shows up in each of the settings that you were just describing, and this kind of competition over how it's remembered and an annual way in which there's an intensity about that. Um, and that was true 228 in Taiwan, um, which is in a weird way, 228 is a kind of hopeful thing to keep in mind in one sense, because for decades that was, um, that memory was repressed and then eventually it was something that could now be, make efforts to, for the state to come to terms with. But that's certainly one of the one of the connections. Um, so in Hong Kong, the anniversary of 1989 was a key moment for commemoration and was a key moment for artistic creation. Uh, the Pillar of Shame statue on the University of Hong Kong campus and the Goddess of Democracy statue on Chinese University of Hong Kong. So that would be some place for people to gather around. In, um, in Thailand, the um, anniversary of the 1976 massacre, October 6, is one of the things that's a commemorative moment. When Joshua Wong was invited um, to Bangkok, to Chulalongkorn University, it was for an uh, October 6th commemoration moment. It was the uh, 40th anniversary. And so they invited somebody from a city that was associated with the ninth commemorating 1989, and they brought they wanted to bring him to be a speaker at an event commemorating another massacre related to um, killings uh, involving a, a movement in which young people were involved. So there was a connection there and a, a parallel um, for that. And then there are other, um, there was a small incident which, I mean there have been some incidents in which this is also something that allows some kind of connection and sense of familiarity uh, or solidarity among activists from these different places. Um, and the st a story that I heard the last time I was here brought that home, I think, very powerfully um, with the Milk Tea Alliance story, which was that some um, Hong Kong activists in 2020, um, once there could no longer be the, the street protests in Hong Kong, but there were pro street protests in Thailand, some Thai and Hong Kong activists that were together, Hong Kong activists sent goggles and other gear to help protect you from tear gas uh, to their Thai. Um, their Thai allies. And some of the Thai allies said, well, we want to do something. What can we do for the Hong Kongers uh, to sort of show reci reciprocity? So what they decided to do was hold a vigil on the anniversary of the June 4th massacre of the kind that people in Hong Kong wanted to do in Hong Kong but would be taking risks to do there. So that was a kind of way, like, we'll commemorate your massacre as a way um, to make, to, to show kind of solidarity for that. So there are these kinds of things. And there was also a, um, there was a small group of um, Thai, um, I'm trying to remember the, the details of this, a small group of Thai um, dissidents, I would call them, who were angry about a Thai figure getting honored by Guangzhou um, for 
an, uh, a, given an award that was related to um, honoring the heroes or the martyrs of, of the 1980 event in, um, in South Korea, who objected to the fact that a Thai uh, artist, artistic figure who was associated with the junta was being honored from that. So there's like a competition over um, this, these traditions as well. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, Jeff. Hello. Hi, Hi Jeff. Uh, just uh, want to get your impressions or your feelings, because I actually don't know. Uh, you, you, you compare the uh, information available, the information courses of, of mainland China, and then, then Hong Kong, and then also th uh, Thailand. I don't know much about Thailand, but it, from being here and just talking to students, it seems like it's pretty much an information porous environment, and you can talk freely about it. I don't know about the state media. Uh, the mainland, we don't we we know exactly what's going on there. The media is very controlled. Hong Kong, as you point out earlier on, you know, seemed to be much more information porous and much more tall, fewer red lines. What's the status of Hong Kong now? Is it like, is it now, is the state media taking full control so that, that these other messages simply can't make it to the mass public that aren't, or is there some kind of, a, because there's massive, more foreign influence and more foreigners there, and also, it's just more person porous in terms of visas and visitor, visitors. What's how would you contrast right now mainland China, Thailand, and uh, Hong Kong in terms of information porousness? That's a, that's a great question. And um, since we spent a lot of time together on the mainland in the early 2000s, I think in some ways Hong Kong now is something like that early 2000s period in, in, on the mainland, where it was always sort of shocking how open-ended it was, even though there were certain things that were tightly controlled. So with Hong Kong, the thing that people, I think, are watching a lot is, and this is about the gradualness, is if, and the gradualness is to sort of, again, to keep investment going, to keep university programs from shutting down and things like that. There's a gradualness, and what hasn't, ha what, what hasn't happened yet in Hong Kong is a complete control of the internet. You don't, it, so there's some blocking of websites and things, but it's, Again, it's, you don't have to go on a VPN to get things. So that's a, that's a greater porousness. Um, there certainly is more, um, there's, there's also reminiscent of the mainland in the early um, 2000s, is there's a lot less worrying about what's being communicated in English than in Chinese. So it's, it's, there's tighter control of the things that the most people are being exposed to. So they talked about taking books off bookshelves. Um, those were largely the Chinese language versions of it, things like that. So Vigil is, uh, was available, at least until recently, in English in Hong Kong, in bookstores. But there's been no Chinese language translation of it. And there's a type, what used to happen in Hong Kong would be, books would be published in Taiwan in complex characters with an idea that Hong Kong would be a key secondary market for them. Now there are books that a Taiwan publisher will know can't be sold in Hong Kong. So there'll be less willingness, less financial incentive to publish things that the Chinese Communist Party dislikes in Taiwan. There still will be some things published. And there have been books about, there are books that take a line on Hong Kong protests similar to mine that have been published by Taiwan publishers. But I do think the lack of interest of a Taiwan publisher in this book has to do with the fact that they couldn't just sell it in Hong Kong as well. So I think things would be different. The one foreign translation of this that's out is in Thai <laughs> by people who are linked to the Thai, uh, the, the Thai connection there. And it's the same people who invited Joshua Wong uh, to speak. Um, now, the porousness here, I think this is another part, is that, and this is something that I think is the really, it's a very interesting thing to try to figure out what um, the, the Thai situation is very complicated because the, the story after 
2010 was that people were talking about things on the streets in, in, um, and the, in protests that had been taboo topics before and had never been discussed that way. And now there have been persecutions. Uh, there, have been, there have been sentencings of people on, um, on LM charges again. What I think some people are saying is, and this again is reminiscent, I think, of China in the early 2000s, is that people are saying things in private that they wouldn't have said earlier. Or I remember notice, the things you would notice in China would be, did two people have to, did, you, did two people who you just introduced who were Chinese have to establish careful things of trust between each other before they would tell political jokes to each other. And in, even in the 1980s, they still, there was a memory of how what you said in private could get you in trouble. So people were quite watchful until they, they established that. But by around 2000, you could introduce two people to each other and they'd be making jokes together about the leadership. And the idea was that the Chinese saying at that point was as long as it's not a movement, anything goes. So there wasn't a policing of, there was a policing of public uh, communication, but not so much private. And my sense is that that kind of porousness may be what's also happening here. Hong Kong, I think it's, Hong Kong, there's a sense of steady tightening. So it's, it's hard, but it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. And it's not stable. As we learned in, there were all kinds of things that now I have to like pinch myself and say, did, were we really able to do this in the mainland? And even in the early Xi Jinping era, I, I was at a book talk at the Bookworm uh, bookstore in Beijing that it was in English it would have been more problematic if it was in Chinese, but there were things that it's just unthinkable and the bookworms closed and a lot of places literally have closed up. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi, Jeffrey, what a depressing conversation. Um, <laughs> I, I am a permanent resident of Hong Kong. I lived there 17 years of my life, so I feel very deeply about these issues. Um, and I was there from the 80s, 90s, and then through the handover until 2006. So I've seen a lot of the changes over those years and still have a lot of friends. Uh, one observation about the happy Hong Kong campaign and whether it's working is that I just booked a flight for my son from the United States to here, and the cheapest flight available was on Cathay Pacific, which was amazing, because that has always been a premium airline more expensive than any other airline to Asia. It was the cheapest of all fares on the internet that day. So that was extraordinary. But my question has nothing to do with that. My question <laughs> is, you're a professor on a US college campus. And what we've discussed and what we've seen here is activism by Asian students who are basically pissing in the wind against authoritarian governments. Why has the American student remained silent in the face of the deterioration and the threat to democracy when they come out to celebrate Hamas? What's happening in America? Well, I'll um, well I'll take I'll take that in a um, in a in a different direction. I mean, one of the things is so the the um, the American student the the quietism. Although there hasn't been complete quietism, we can think about. Um, there were, there were um, protests um, against the invasion of Iraq. There were, there were some moments of protest, but there hasn't been, um, there, I think it's, it's partly the weakness of traditions of student activism in, um, in, in the United States. I mean, there was the 60s, which looms very large in kind of popular memory, which had a very specific, um, was a very specific phenomenon. I think the recurring set of student-led activism in Asia is, is really extraordinary. And it's, I mean, for me, that's the thing that kind of needs to be explained. Because you're right, it's up against incredible odds. It is, and showing extraordinary bravery and also just the sheer size of, again, with activism, um, followed by student or campus activism that then spreads 
to other parts of society. The Hong Kong protests, I like to, I mean, when the, if there were over a million, close to two million people on the streets of the biggest protests, those weren't just the biggest protests in the history of Hong Kong, but the biggest his protests, some of the biggest protests in the history of the world per capita. If you think about some like one in four people being on the streets, there's a, um, that's a, that's a kind of percentage that's, that's just amazing. And those are things like that. So I think that's one of the things. I will mention the one moment that I was really inspired by, um, though it was very short-lived in the United States, um, was I, w I happened to be in um, Washington, D.C. for an Asian studies meeting when um, the biggest protest against gun violence on American, camp uh, on American high schools took place. Uh, organized by, um, by high school students. And I think if you want to talk also about the kind of quiescence of Americans in the face of just horrific kinds of things, to think about how limited um, the protests over um, mass shootings have been. That's just extraordinary. But that was really inspiring. It was a short-lived event. It didn't lead to an ongoing movement. But it was the moment when I thought of students' activism that was in, that had something in common with the, what I was seeing in Hong Kong and actually had something in common as well with um, Greta Thunberg and others in the climate extinction thing, which was a sense that an older generation has really shown its inability to deal with something that we are, gonna, that we are living with the impact of in a very visceral way, or in the case of the Hong Kong and climate change, that is going to affect a, a long period of our lives so that we need to take dramatic action of a new kind. So that would be one of the things there. And if you wanted to think of the other, the other thing that happened in the United States that had resonances or connected up and was, was of great interest to people, young people in other parts of the world where the Black Lives Matter um, protests in 2020, where you also thought, where again, th these are each different kinds of things, but I think the scale and um, steadiness of the protests uh, by young people in Asia is truly amazing. And it was even amazing in 2022 on the mainland, where the white paper protests, short lived though they were, but people were taking a kind of risk about um, lives potentially being ruined by taking an action that's very different from actually most of the protests that happen on American campuses in any period, I think. So thanks so much for that question. Hi, another permanent resident of Hong Kong. We're coming out of the woodwork today. Um, I actually live there now. I've lived there for 18 years and I'm visiting here. And I want to thank you, first of all, because what you're doing is keeping the idea of Hong Kong and what's going on there alive. And it's something that those of us who still live there can't do um, because of the ways that the national security law in Hong Kong has been written. It's actually illegal to say things that are considered to be inciting to subversion. Um, there are sedition laws on the books. There are NSL laws that prevent people even from speaking outside of Hong Kong about Hong Kong. So I'm not going to identify myself, but I wanted to also answer your question about happy Hong Kong, because this goes to something that I think that is being missed by a lot of people outside of Hong Kong. Hong Kongers have not just lay down and died. Um, happy Hong Kong was received as the, the ironic sad joke that it, that it was. It was a terrible campaign anyway. Um, but I think if you look at that election that you mentioned that happened a few weeks ago, the participation rate of that election was 27.5%. This is in spite of the fact that the government of Hong Kong spent 100 million Hong Kong dollars to promote that election, and they were anxious to the point of being crazy to get people to vote. And nevertheless, uh, I think they saw it as a referendum on their new happy Hong Kong, obviously. 
And in spite of that, and in spite of all of their incentive, they even were sending memos to all the civil servants, telling them about their civic obligation to vote. In spite of all of that, you only got 27.5% of the population out to vote. Um, and there's still quite a bit of what's now being called, I think you're probably familiar with the term soft resistance, um, which may be something you wanna talk about. So in a very real way to live in Hong Kong right now, yes, there is a sense in which it's not as information porous as it used to be. There's a sense at which you feel people calculating what they will say in public. Nobody wants to step across the red line, but nobody knows what the red line is. So there's a great deal of self-censorship. Anyway, my question is about the law, because what I see has been happening in Hong Kong is the law has been used in a very different way than what was used to put, to put down Tiananmen Square. It's being used as a way to transform history. And by that, what I'm seeing, and I'm wondering if you're seeing this too, they're trying to get, the Hong Kong government is trying to get people to uh, plead guilty to crimes uh, even when these people believe that they're not really guilty. And there's been an incredible amount of pressure. They've, they've withheld bail from innumerable. I think right now the bail population of the Hong Kong prisons is over 40%. So that's 40% of the people in Hong Kong prisons who haven't been convicted of anything. Um, and the reason why they're turning the screws on these people is because if you read the judgments that are being written by the prosecutions in Hong Kong, they're all about, they use words like riots, black clad rioters over and over again. And they're, it seems like they're trying to create an alternative reality through legal documents. And I wonder if you see this happening in any other part of Southeast Asia, how you would relate it to what, happens, what happened in mainland China after 1989. Thanks, thanks so much for all of that. And I mean, to sum it up pithily, um, I've been talking about red lines. I shouldn't forget the yellow economy. So this is that people disproportionately frequenting stores that, and, and restaurants that were, see, that were sympathetic to the protests and finding other ways to um, use whatever space there is available um, to, to do what they can within this kind of uh, 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 structure. And so it's, it's it, and also it's a biding time to try to keep alive things. The diaspora is doing all sorts of things to try to, to keep alive things about Hong Kong that can't be talked about within Hong Kong that feeds back and forth. Um, one of the other things you mentioned, the way that law is being used, also the way that efforts to break people when they're um, arrested through pressures of different kinds is being used. That was actually one of, the first, one of the first things that was reminiscent actually of um, Hong Kong now and Thailand in 2014. In 2014 and 2015, 2016, there were people who were subjected to what's called attitude, um, what is it, attitude adjustment. Adjustment. Attitude, attitude adjustment, which sounds very much like what um, Agnes Chow describes having to go through before she could get her passport back, she had to take these kind of patriotism tour to try to correct her attitude. And these kinds of things, there, there were parallels in um, the Mao era of re-education, and there still are sort of efforts at re-education on the mainland. The specific use of that, you know, um, the specific use of the law and the protracted processes, and this is, it's a particular mix of things, of different legal traditions being, um, used and violated. I mean, you, there, there are people who are being, and it's a par partly, I think, to make it a confusing story for the world to talk about. Like, national security law is the biggest thing that's shifted, but not everybody's being prosecuted via that. Some are being prosecuted by old colonial era sedition laws that were left there, and you have this, it makes it just a complicated story, and it also makes the numbers smaller when people do talk about how many people are being prosecuted by national security law. It's a different legal system. It just makes it a complicated story to, to keep up with in that way. Um, 
but I think it's, it's important to, um, to realize also that a lack of protest does not mean that people are on board with the official narrative about uh, that the, the state, and this is something we've learned over and over again with authoritarian uh, states in different places. There's an overestimation of how many people are um, finding quiet ways. So soft resistance is something that, um, that happens, whether people use that term or not, it was keeping, when people probably thought there was less resistance, resistance to the junta here than there actually was, it was because that was being done through, um, through small ways and private ways that kept alive for the next time. It's no accident that uh, somebody who's being read a lot in Hong Kong and talked about and read a lot and talked about in Thailand in certain circles is Vaclav Havel. And this was kind of soft resistance before there was um, the term, was about what you did to keep alive, whether it was called living in truth, about different ways of using whatever space uh, you had, as long as there was space, and depending on people with more space to talk about things outside of that. So there are efforts by, um, by the Hong Kong exile community to try to keep people from forgetting um, what's been going on there. So um, there, are, there are places in which legal, legal methods are not uh, used the same way, but I think the particular use of the law and intimidation through cases and delayed cases is something that has parallels here more than in some other places, that it's uh, both soft resistance and a kind of effort to have it seem like a softer form of authoritarianism than at times it, 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 it really is. Um, I wanted to, I, I brought some books. Um, I brought a, a couple copies of my book, um, but I also decided that I would bring um, some copies of the, the book Vigil came out in this series from Columbia Global Reports, a publisher, a niche publisher, boutique publisher in the US linked to the Columbia School of Journalism. And it was brought out to try to um, get small books for busy people about topics that were underreported or were being, being, not being covered in the kind of depth that was happening when there was better funding for foreign correspondents, um, when people could do um, these kinds of things. So they're, they're tended to be by either journalists writing in a kind of long form way that's, that's hard for them to do and the, the press gives them um, some, t some money to spend the time going deeper into a story, or for academics like me who are willing to write in a kind of journalistic fashion uh, about something that, you know, leaving the scholarly debate side of it to the, to the side and having something that the idea is these are books that in a couple of hours uh, somebody who wants to know more than they're getting from a soundbite driven news um, um, but less than they would have to invest in a big book. So um, Vigil was, was uh, commissioned by them before actually the 2019 protests began. And it was going to be a book that was going to end with the Tiananmen Vigil of 2019 and just say, um, I had a kind of pessimism even then, like probably this kind of thing will not be able to happen much longer. I had to kind of shift as I was midway through the project and make it about this extraordinary flourishing of Hong Kong. I had to finish the book while the protests were still going on. I picked October 1st, 2019 as a cutoff date. And I left with a kind of pessimistic view of saying that even though this movement has exceeded anything that people thought it could do, I don't see an end game that's anything other than a tightening of the screws in Hong Kong. I finished the book in uh, the proofs where the last moment I could correct them were in November of 2019. And then there were the, um, right before the district council elections that were swept by democratic forces. And I thought, oh no, I've ended on too pessimistic a note. But then I think it actually was the right um, pessimism of ending of, of where things were going while still I think to keep from being completely pessimistic, one thing you learn when you're working on, um, on these kinds of st stories and processes 
is that often history defies even the best kind of um, expectations. And if you were 30 years after the, um, the massacre in Taiwan in the late 1940s, you would have said this is just, the, the history of this has been totally suppressed um, and Taiwan just seems stuck in a mode of being a right-wing authoritarian one-party state. And then it wasn't. Things change in the world and things, um, things alter. Um, there are different moments. In Thailand, it looked actually uh, even just about a year ago as though something just extraordinary was going to happen and that a place that seemed locked into um, one kind of authoritarianism was going, was going to have this election or it had this election that looked like it was going to completely transform it and now it's something more um, complicated and less optimistic, but there, there are surprises. It was surprising to many people here how well Move Forward did in that election. So there's keeping up that possibility for surprise. But I'll just mention, early on there was a book in the series, um, High Speed Empire, that was about Chinese expansion and into Southeast Asia. And this came out um, in the mid-2010s. And, and it's very, very short, even shorter than Vigil, I think this. And it was somebody who did spend time uh, around where these Chinese development pride, I'm glad you know that. Um, this was a book, The Call, that is a little longer, but just fascinating. Came out in 2020, so which was a hard time for books to, on anything to come out. And it was kind of about the um, Saudi efforts to um, foster a certain kind of view of Islam in many parts of the world. Um, and it's just fascinating on a very, partly on a very underreported part of the world, Indonesia. Um, <laughs> There's one called Speech Police that isn't about Asia, but it's about the way different, uh, different regimes are trying to deal with hate speech in different ways on the internet. Um, and that's something that's, that has a very, is very important a story in Southeast Asia by a former UN Special Rapporteur for Speech Freedom who's a law professor. There's a little book called The Subplot that I really like, which is about what ordinary Chinese people are actually reading. Um, looking at genres of popular literature and getting beyond, getting an idea of how, how diversified, even under authoritarian, uh, an authoritarian system, what people write and read can be, even when it moves outside of um, the lines. And then there's one that came out uh, after Vigil, and I'm very pleased that I helped play a role in kind of matchmaking the academic who could write in this mode um, with him is on Xinjiang. It's on the, um, the camp, camp system there and the suppression of the Uyghurs and connects it to um, things in, in China but also connects it to the war on terror and the way that that made the possibility for Uyghurs to be um, demonized in the way that they were. And so I brought a, a sample copy of each of these if people want to look at them afterwards. Thank you, there's a lot to browse through. Um, do we have any more questions from the floor? Yes, please. Oh, um, do, you, do you want to go first, Asina? I think, yeah. What's the future of protesters? <laughs> the future, so, so um, <laughs> there's, there's a, um, the future of protests is that we don't know what the future of protests is. So there's one thing, that I've learned from studying youth movements for a long time is that there will be um, a continual description of a new generation of youth as not being as politically active as the earlier ones. And often, but not in all cases, that will be proved wrong. Um, the T I got to China in 1986 and people said, oh, you study youth movements. It's too bad because this generation only cares about hair perms and disco music. And then in 1986, before the year had ended, there was the biggest kind of spontaneous, largely student protest since, since the um, Cultural Revolution or before. Um, and then Hong Kong, you know, oh, well, you're coming to Hong Kong in the early 2000s, well, you're interested in this, well, this generation won't do that. So we'll see more, more youth protests. We'll see more protests in other places. I also, there was a book on, um, an early book on the internet, um, in the 1990s um, that said 
you know, Tiananmen might have been the last time that people gathering in person in a big square really matters in protest because of this may be an era when everything's digital online. Everything's digital online and people are still gathering in squares and it still matters a lot when people gather in physical proximity. So I think, I mean, that's, and it may happen in places that we don't expect it to would be another one there. Uh, so that's the, a waffling answer, but I think it's actually one I believe. Yes, please. Hi, uh, this, this is actually a linked one. Um, you mentioned T Alliance a couple of times. And I wondered, uh, what is your assessment of that movement and, and what is its future? So uh, the Milk Tea Alliance, and for anybody who doesn't uh, know about it, I love the story of the Milk Tea Alliance. It's that, you know, it grew out of, uh, um, the, co the term was coined in 2020 after there was a uh, um, social media um, Chinese hyper-nationalists on the mainland picking on a Thai celebrity for having uh, referred or liked a post that referred to Hong Kong as one of his favorite countries. And there was this idea that this was an inappropriate way uh, to talk about um, a part of the Chinese state. And there were also some posts about Taiwan. And there were a call for apologies and some activists in Hong Kong and Taiwan were saying don't back down and people were trying to figure out, so, or playing around online and saying, well, what do people in Thai Thailand, Taiwan, and Hong Kong have in common besides a worry of be sometimes pushing back at an official view of, of, of the Chinese state? So we all drink tea with milk in it as a kind of iconic beverage rather than um, tea without milk the way they do on the mainland. And so there were memes that were showing up showing these cups of different kinds of milk tea swearing allegiance to each other in kind of three musketeers style and then it was blended with a three finger salute and all kinds of things. So it was this solidarity thing that was online only in the early 2020s but then with the uh, Thailand protests that picked up on some of these things that and, it, and there was the milk tea alliance before the milk tea alliance. There were precursors to this in expressions of solidarity and trying to learn from each other among um, these places. So then, it, then there were actual the protests in uh, Thailand and then Burma after the coup there was brought into this Milk Tea Alliance and um, in symbolic terms and on, on uh, the internet it was, it, was, it was a big deal and also there was also another thing that I love, a uh, moment of this, there were different rap groups from different parts of the region that collaborated on a We Are the World style joint rap thing where the Milk Tea Alliance was about anti-authoritarianism in your own country and worrying about Chinese authoritarianism casting a shadow over the whole region. It never had formal structures, um, but it was something of kind of shared cheering each other on, and that matters, I think. When you're doing impossible seeming uh, protests, it really matters if you think other people are paying attention to you. And so it mattered in that way. I think it's fissuring, and one of the ways that it's, it's going, and I, I'm writing a book for this series, a sequel to Vigil of Sorts, but not just about Hong Kong, went into the, was going to be about the Milk Tea Alliance. And now it's increasingly going to be about Thailand and connections between Thailand and protests in other places, especially Hong Kong, but also kind of recovering this kind of regional side to stories that we often miss when we think of them either locally or globally. But as I've been working on it, and I thought of it as Thailand, uh, Thai activists and Hong Kong activists were the sort of most invested in this Milk Tea Alliance idea, and I was talking, I've been talking a lot to Hong Kong exiles, but one of the things that's happened in the discussions with Hong Kong exiles is their sense of parallels between their situation is now they're thinking it's strongest between them and other exiled groups from the frontiers of the PRC. So they're thinking of connections and solidarity 
with um, activists in uh, exile from Tibet and from Xinjiang. And that's a different set of solidarities. And when there is um, a kind of joint protest, when I was in um, London, I spent the spring in London on a visiting position and went to a couple of events, including one outside the Chinese embassy there on June 4th. And there wasn't discussions of the Milk Tea Alliance, but there were references of solidarity with, um, with Tibet and um, Xinjiang. And I think the Hong Kong exiles are sometimes, again, because of the memories of Tiananmen, they're thought about as sometimes kind of a current counterpart to the Tiananmen exiles. But I don't think they really fit that mold because the Tiananmen exiles were largely thinking, I have a country that someday we ho I hope will change in a way that I can go back there and be part of a more liberal version of it. The Hong Kong exiles are really thinking about a homeland that's being destroyed. And that gives them, and that wanting to preserve a sense of what is so special about a culture that exists there that didn't exist anyplace else, that didn't exist on the Chinese mainland and doesn't exist on the Chinese mainland and still exists in these underground forms there. And that seems to map on to something not like what the Tiananmen exiles are talking about, but what some of the Tibetan exiles are talking about. And their uh, Hong Kong exiles have talked about wanting to learn from Tibetans in a way that there can be people who've never set foot in Tibet who still feel an attachment to the culture that is associated with that. And this is part of what the, the version of the yellow economy outside of Hong Kong is partly setting up things like Hong Kong film festivals in, uh, outside, setting up, I went to a, a wonderful restaurant in London that is filled with photographs from the 2019 protests, serves authentic Hong Kong dishes and style and is a way of saying this isn't resisting the idea of folding Hong Kong into a kind of broader China. Thank you. Do we have another question? Yeah, so my question is doing all your research throughout the decades, um, was, was there like a continuous collection in terms <coughs> of how artists create things as a way to express themselves, but later on pick up by people <coughs> who want to show it, their expression? So what I personally observed, there are a few examples. One was a white purple protest in China last year. So at one point, the government start blocking the images of white shield paper. And when that happened, because um, there, there was a Chinese contemporary artist, his name is Liu Jianhua, who's a dear friend of mine. Years and years ago, he did, um, he's a porcelain artist. So what he did many years ago, over decades ago, like was he created porcelain look exactly like a sheet of paper. So it, it was beautiful. And when the, the image of white sheet of real paper was blocked on WeChat and all that. Uh, a lot of people in China who knew about what the artist did decades ago start to use the image of his artwork as a way to show their protest mode. However, the artist feel completely got very awkward because he didn't have any you know, intention of doing this. So that's uh, one interesting example that somehow accidentally were chosen. And, and then another, since you go to London all the time, you might have heard the story. Last year, there was a Royal Academy student who was originally from China. Because of all that event happened in East Asia over the past few years, he started to write the Da Zibao, right? The, 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 what's the right word to call Big that? Big character posters. Big character posters as a propaganda, exactly the wording of the Communist Party. So he just laid it out in the public in, in the central part of London and let people to interpret themselves. So, and then there was an interesting event happened afterwards. So, so I wonder whether you, based on what you have raised, or you have some examples or want to talk a little bit on that. Thank this you. is great. And actually, this is a good way of saying like, uh, you know, I think it's actually an explanation of, I, I, thought, I thought doing this project was going to be incredibly depressing. And in a sense it is, because there's, 
time and time again the settings in the recent period where we're, we're living in a period of you know, democratic, dem democracy is under threat, including in, in the United States, clearly. Um, what, the reason it's not depressing is because of the incredible inventiveness of, um, of activists, including artists in different kinds of settings that keeps you thinking, you know, it's, it's just extraordinary what people can do. Um, it was amazing when the banners were put up in Beijing on the bridge in uh, early, uh, 2022, and then uh, in the fall of 2022, and then the the slogans were all banned. But then there were Chinese students on campuses outside of China that would put things up because you could do that outside of China, and then the slogans would circulate back into China. And then there was a lot of humor in the protests each time. I I co-wrote a piece with Christopher Ray, who's written a book on Chinese humor, on all the ways that. There were you know, puns and humor used through art and other things. Um, there are all kinds of ways to think about this. Um, and there's, there's the inventiveness of, of symbols that are used. I mean, we can think of this coded language in all kinds of ways when, I mean, you're probably familiar with this, when Me Too was banned in China, uh, discussions of the Me Too movement, people would put up rice and bunnies because the word for rice is me and the word for bunny is too. So, you know, rice bunny became a way of talking about something you couldn't talk about. Um, so that's a kind of creativity uh, would be shown artistically. The last, um, the last piece I wrote was actually about the Goddess of Democracy statue. It was banned on the mainland in 1989. It showed up in Hong Kong um, and it was there for a long time, taken down. The last time I saw something of the Goddess of Democracy was a woman who was the master of ceremonies at the June 4th vigil in London, was dressed up like the goddess of democracy and holding up uh, a torch. So you have all of these kinds of play with different kinds of symbols and artistic things. I mentioned the Hunger Games. Um, you know, I'm sure my students now have a drinking game. If, when's he gonna mention the Hunger Games? We'll do that. But um, when young activists in Hong Kong, um, the political party, Demisisto uh, was um, Nathan Law, Joshua Wong, and Agnes Chow, they put up a poster when they were going to, about what they represented, and they, they had Agnes Chow dressed up like the heroine of, um, the Hunger Games or invoking that, and the poster said the Younger Games as a way of, you know, elect younger people. So there's incredible play with popular culture in all kinds of ways that is really inspiring because people can do these very subtle things that don't get banned because only people in the know kind of realize it. Um, and the creativity of protesters are just amazing. In Thailand, here there was, um, you know, 1984, there was a showing of the film 1984 that was shut down in, uh, when the coup happened in 2014. There was a law put in that banned gatherings of five or more people. So groups of four young activists would show up at a designated spot, each holding up a copy of 1984 as a way of showing this is the world we're living in. And actually one reason the Hunger Games took off as a symbol was the Hunger Games movie wasn't banned at that point shut down. So people were smart enough to realize in a, in a way that it took longer for the authorities. The, there's always a, often a lag time. And they started thinking, well, this is a similar story about people in an autocratic state being sick of it. So they started using the three finger salute until that got, got criminalized. So there's a continual uh, flow of this and creativity. Artists and also just the interplay between uh, popular culture and other things that keeps a step ahead of the authorities. Makes it very hard to research as somebody who's no longer young because youth culture, I, um, I need to spend a lot of time hanging out with people much younger than I am who can tell me what I'm missing about you know, the subtleties, like what is this? Why is this subversive um, to do that? And you know, keep up with, with, with jokes, that jokes and art and music are all things that, um, that keep these things alive. You mentioned the big character posters and let people just interpret it. Sometimes you can take something that's officially okay and you can inject it with a twist. During the Tiananmen protests, one of the songs that was sung most often 
was the Internationale. Because like, oh, really listen to the lyrics here. It's saying this is the theme song of the Chinese Communist Party, but it actually says that people should stand up for at moments. So that's, that's an ongoing story that makes it so exciting. And um, yeah, and we need to keep sharing senses of this to understand how these, um, what um, hidden transcripts is one of the academic words that's used for this. And Ian Johnson has just written this book, Sparks, that's about the way in which different kinds of uh, underground sort of modes of uh, telling stories about the past, recounting things, um, underground stories keep things alive in a system like, like China's. And we've seen that it's, it's not, it's a new, f it's talked about sometimes as a new phenomenon, but there are variations of it earlier periods too. And there were popular underground historians like Dai Ching in the 1980s who were doing that. There were underground artists in the Chinese case in other times. And there's still the counterparts um, to that going on here, going on in Hong Kong. Thank you. We're going to take one last question. Hi. I'm, I'm wondering if your research uh, is investigating um, the spaces of, of protest and democracy. Um, the, the differences, for example, between Tiananmen Square and, say, Sanam Luang. Yeah, no, that's a great, uh, great um, question. And spaces are, um, spaces are crucial for this. And I mean, one of the things is also um, what kinds of, um, how, how monuments connected to past events become spaces of gathering and how actually mm -hmm. there are also um, spatial, spatial, um, congestion versus flexible things. One of the main things that the Hong Kong activists talked about in 2019 a lot was the need to not be continually gathering in one place and settling in there the way they did in 2014 because it made it easy to suppress. And that the idea of the biggest thing that was part of the Hong Kong protests that was picked up in other places that is, I think, a key part of this idea of the Milk Tea Alliance also was be water, um, flexible strategies, flash mobs, changing locales. So I think that uh, that's a that spatial thing of not um, not picking one spot and settling in there, even though that's been a big part of protests in many parts of the world for many many times. Um, so I think that's that's part of it. Um, but I think that that idea of um, there are symbolically important places that activists go again and again in different, in different settings, and these become very important. There's also a way in which part of the recent style of um, process to try to keep, it, it's always a cat and mouse game between the activists and the, an authoritarian state. How do you keep, keep the ability to keep going? And one is to try to use codes and to try to be able to use subversion in ways that aren't as obviously subversive. Another is to mix the balance of going to a place that everybody knows to go and that has symbolic balance to keep going there and also um, move different places so that you're not as easy uh, to suppress. Does that make sense? Thank you. Well, if, if there's anything that passed one and a half hours has taught us that history plays out in ways that surprise us over and over again. Um, we've talked a lot about how the, spa the political spaces have been constricted you know, over time, but I hope to end this discussion perhaps on a more optimistic note. Um, what are the bright spots you see still in Hong Kong and um, Thailand? And also, what can people, what can the average person do to keep these political spaces open? So, um, so I'll, 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 I'll end with, okay, the, um, so music is, music is very uh, important to me in thinking about everything, but in terms of uh, protest for there and, um, there's a, uh, there's there, and so in this project I talk about songs that have mattered in 
to Hong Kong activists and to um, Thai activists and others. And it's it, the songs that can people can get excited by sometimes come are things that aren't initially subversive songs, but become and take on new meanings. Um, uh, Do you hear the people sing? Is a great example also of something that's flowed, sung in many places, but has had particular power uh, in these areas. But there's a line by um, by Leonard Cohen that isn't from a song that people protest, but the song anthem that I think is one of the great songs that I I keep coming back to as I think about these kinds of things. Um, and it just says uh, the lines that really resonate. And he wrote this after events like the Velvet Revolution, after um, a time of dramatic protests in the 1980s and early 90s, which is a play- time to think back if you want to feel somewhat optimistic. And it just says, um, uh, forget your perfect offering, um, ring the bells that still can ring. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. And I think what what activists do or what ordinary people do in these things is try to figure out that there, there are cracks in everything. There are always ways that, um, that, and that structures of domination are always changing. There are always possibilities for change, even as hard as they seem um, to be. So that's a kind of cautious optimism. Thank you. Uh, please join me. Thank you, Professor Wasserstrom, for this fascinating discussion. Uh, there's still books that he's brought that you feel free to browse. And um, we've got uh, food and drink available at the restaurant till um, late night tonight. So <laughs> please feel free to hang around the club. Thank you. And thank you so much. And thank you for the, the questions and comments. It was really great.